I thank God for our times of corporate worship. Certainly, as we read God's Word privately, those are meaningful times, and, and boy, we've had some meaningful times, some interesting times, haven't we, here in the last couple of weeks? If you made a commitment two weeks ago, it's been two weeks. Hang in there, okay? Hang in there. Um, I know it's challenging, but what you're experiencing is the press of the world and the inconveniences of life that are pressing in on the most important thing in your life, and that is your time with the Lord. Nothing, no one, no other interests are more important than the time that you spend with the Lord. There's just nothing. And when you worship the Lord privately, those are such meaningful times, but when we worship the Lord corporately, they, it, it just magnifies what God's doing in our own personal lives. But there are times, and I just experienced one of those moments just a little while ago as we were worshiping, when God gives clarity about something in your life and about a purpose in your life that you realize, and I realized. And um, if I started talking about it now, we would not get into this message. And so we, we, we must move on, but I praise the Lord for the clarity that he has given Genesis chapter 8, verse 1, one verse, and then we'll back up to chapter 6, but God remembered Noah, Amen. but God remembered Noah, and from that single statement in Genesis 8, you have this cascading effect that occurs back into chapter 6. And through chapter 8 into chapter 9, Hebrew scholars call it a chiastic structure. Don't have to remember that, but anyways, just think in terms of this cascading effect. Back through chapter 7 to chapter 6, through chapter 8 and 9. But the pivoting and riveting verse is that God remembered Noah 150 days after a flood, a worldwide flood that was devastating upon a humanity that God said he would bless, but were refusing to experience the blessing of God according to how God had ordered the blessings. God said he would bless them, but men as we see in the case of Adam and Eve last week in Genesis 3, began to exert their independence and find that they could be or they could exert their independence in such a way that they would become like God, that they themselves could possess this God-likeness and, and they would exert their independence and not their dependence upon the Lord. And so since the very fall of man in Genesis 3, we see this this plummeting of humanity into just a deep, dark pit. How could it go bad so quickly, right? Some of you that I know I've been talking to, and you're reading the scripture, and it's like, I thought this story was better than this. <laughs> you didn't say it like that, but I can see it on your face. It's sort of like, I mean, these people are bad, and they get worse. <laughs> And it just, like, I, I mean, and then a brother kills a brother, and it, just, and it just snowballs. And it's so bad that by Genesis 6, when you, we begin to pick up the story, verse 1, when man began to multiply in the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any that they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. That's an interesting conversation. Also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them, they were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. It's like, what in the world is going on. <laughs> Can you say rain? Because <laughs> this is how God's going to deal with this. That a world is turning upside down 
because the hearts of men were continuously wicked, is what the Scripture goes on to say. Now, we're going to survey these multiple chapters. You have read them. If you haven't, you need to read these. Trust me. And, and I want you to, when you read them, you're, you're, you're going to look at this frame in this time period, and you're going to look at that, and you're going to try to characterize everything by that time frame in history. But you need to know that God is standing outside of history, above history. It's not like he's disconnected from time and space in this world that we live in. He created it. He's not a God who creates and steps away and just sort of lets things spin out of control. No, God now is going to intervene in the world that he created. But you have to understand that God is seeing things in the larger picture, the larger storyline. So keep that in mind when you read these verses that God is not through. But the redeeming fact of this is that God remembered Noah in all of this. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And I want you to see, to begin with, we see the grief of the Lord in these first several verses. The hearts of men were turning wicked. And, and, and the perversion that was taking place. Obviously, something is going on here that is horrific in nature. And when you look at these, these pa- this passage of Scripture and you consider what might be happening, there are several ideas. We do not have time to get into this for sure. But I want you to uh, go to our website, go to the resources that we're going to list by date, and you'll be able to read an article by the Gospel Coalition. It basically represents my point of view on this particular passage of Scripture that is substantiated by well-reasoned thinking scholars. And uh, while there are differences of opinion here, who are, this, who are the Nephilim? Who are, these, uh, who are these people? Who are these persons that Their acts are of such a nature that God is going to bring a judge upon the earth, a judgment upon the earth. Who who are these people? Who are these these persons? Some have suggested that these were human rulers. Others have suggested these are descendants of the Sethites, you know, the descendants of Seth. Others, and it's the position that I simply take, but there's more to it, obviously, than the very brief moments. We talk about it this morning that these are fallen angels. Um, and the, the nature of their relationship with humanity is they've transgressed, they've stepped across the line, uh, and they are violating God's command. There's this, this interaction between them. There's, uh, there's this ungodly interaction that is occurring uh, between these fallen angels in humanity of such a horrific nature that even Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed because of it, um, that, the, that the people are pounding on the walls of Lot, right? You remember, you remember that story? And, 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 and who are these visiting persons to Lot's home? They were angels. Crazy things going on. The kinds of things that are written in mythology and other things from which they might derive their understanding. I'm not saying it's mythology. I'm saying that mythology takes stories like this and derives understandings from it, their own conjurings. But anyways, we don't have time to get into it. I told you we couldn't do it. So stop making me go there. (laughs) But there's something so horrific, so perverted that is going on that that God God is going to bring judgment upon the earth. There are other accounts of the creation in which uh, ancient Near East um, creation accounts suggest that why God is going to bring judgment upon the earth, he's going to do so because the world is becoming overpopulated. That's why. We're sort of hearing sounds of that today, aren't we? That the world was becoming overpopulated and because of all the noise that they were making, it was disturbing the divine and so he brought judgment on the earth. What kind of God is that? Now we know men can act ridiculous, but God doesn't. What kind of God would bring judgment upon the earth because it's becoming overpopulated? That would be against the very notion that God said to go and to multiply and flourish and to, and, and to, you know, to create and to populate this world. Would, uh, anyways, there's so, so many crazy notions about what really is happening in the world at that time. But whatever's going on, whatever's occurring here is such a horrific nature 
And whatever, whatever you walk away, you may say these are rulers. You may, you may see these are descendants of Seth. You may say they're fallen angels. Wherever you, wherever you might land on this, you better, let, you better land on the position which says that there's some serious stuff going on here and God, his wrath is kindled upon humanity. We see human wickedness, don't we? But we also see a wounded heart on the part of God. While men are being wicked, and God sees all of the wickedness and don't think for a moment he doesn't see what you're doing. Don't even kid yourself because God sees it all. And when he sees all of this human wickedness that's going on, you know what? His heart is wounded. He's grieving. He's lamenting. It stirs the heart of our God. At the heart of God's wrath that's being poured out upon the earth, at the very heart of it is the lament of God to see all that he has created and what he has created that they have rebelled and that they are committing such acts of, 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 of violence. In verse five, and the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Some translations use the word imaginations. In other words, men, went, men were putting together, they were devising such perverted things, they were, they were framing such things, they were inventing, this is the idea behind intentions or imaginations, that they were imagining and inventing things that were so wicked, they were, they were, they were so wicked that when God looked upon that, he had no choice because it, had God not brought judgment upon the earth, what would it have said about him? It would have been inconsistent with himself. And so, out of his wrath that is motivated by his sense of, of a broken heart, out of his lament for the humanity that he's created, he devises a plan. And this plan is going to be fulfilled by Noah. It's a plan to build an ark. You can go to Kentucky today, and actually they have a replica of it. I think a few of you have even been there. It's amazing. There's some videos online. You can watch that. It might even be a great family trip for you to go and see the actual design of Noah's Ark. Much conversation centering around Noah's Ark and if, in fact, it's been discovered today on Mount Ararat and so forth and so on. There's a whole lot in these chapters that I can't really get into. But what I'm trying to get into is what God is doing in the midst of humanity that has become wicked and the wickedness of humanity, we see the broken heart of God lamenting over his creation, now willing to, in his judgment, to also devise a plan, a plan wherein he's going to instruct Noah, you can read it for yourself, to go and to build this, this um, incredible uh, vessel, this incredible vessel that, that will house animals of the same kind, very important, the idea that they are of the same kind. By the way, you can't repopulate, you know, unless you, unless you have a male and a female of the same kind. That's how God's design is. That's God's design from the very act of creation. It will always be his design. If humans are going to flourish, we will flourish because male and female have joined themselves together and we are, we are replicating ourselves through the God-ordained process of replication, of procreation, and that is God's way of expanding humanity and his image upon the earth because we, Genesis 1, we are his image bearers. He created us in his image and he designed us in such a way that we too would have a creative function in, in, in the economy of God that would reflect not only, uh, not only be good for us but would reflect the glory of God. It would say something about the God who had created. This is a marvelous thing that we see in this vessel that God has created and he instructs Noah to go ahead and build it for 120 years He's building it. And the New Testament tells us that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. The very fact that he was constructing this vessel, this ark, and he was building it according to God's very particular design, and that he would finish it according to God's design, the fact that he's doing that is, shows his willingness to exercise faith. His faith is seen by his obedience. The Bible says that it was by faith, Hebrews 11 tells us, that Noah engaged this. 
it's always been by faith. Salvation has always been by faith. But the salvation that saves us by faith is a salvation that is made evident by obedience. You always know when faith is present because obedience is going to follow. And the result of Noah, who was willing to trust God's plan, was he was obedient for 120 years, proclaiming the plan of God, the rightness and the righteousness of God. This is what he's doing. And so for all of this period of time, he's proclaiming God's plan, that there is an opportunity for salvation. Not only eight people, Noah and his children and their, their wives, are the ones who actually come on to the ark itself. Uh, this is not the, you know, popular version several years ago of Noah's ark where we got Tubal Cain on the ark as well. It's sort of like, okay, Hollywood, we've, you know, there we go. We got additional people on Noah's ark. The Bible doesn't say it, but somehow they got on. <laughs> Trust me, if you were there on that occasion when you saw the rain, which you had never seen before, and you thought, what well, can we say rain? What is this? We know what water looks like, but falling from the sky, we don't know what that looks like. And here it all comes down. You would be rushing to the ark that Noah had been building, thinking that crazy man, he was building something. Honey, get your stuff. Let's go. I mean, like some of y'all in the explosion, right, a, a couple of months ago, it was sort of like, the windows are broken, we don't have time to analyze this, get in the car and let's go, right? Isn't that what you did? I know you did, you told me. Get your stuff, I don't know what's happening, let's go. Well, thankfully, you're safe and we're all here to talk about it. But those people who said, honey, get your stuff, let's go, that crazy guy that we've been watching all those years, there's something to all that. And then you show up and realize it's, there, there's no way to get into this thing anymore. How do you get in this thing? <laughs> well, we don't know. We didn't really watch them that closely to see anything about the design. Anyways, I don't know what they said other than there was, must have been wailing and weeping and gnashing of teeth, scratching at the outside of the ark, trying their best to get, on, get onto it, hold onto it in the midst of this great flood, a flood that God brings upon the earth, not because he doesn't care about humanity. It's because he cares that he brings his judgment. Remember, his wrath, his judgment is being poured out because he is of his mercy, because of his lament, because of his grief, because of, a, if we could say, if we could use the term his wounded heart. You know I'm speaking in human terms when I say that. Obviously, God doesn't have a literally wounded heart. You know what I'm talking about, figuratively speaking. And so we, we see God's, we see his grief in all of this and, and, and the, the rebellion of, of, of humanity, uh, over the rebellion of humanity. And, and so he sends this, this flood upon the earth. But then in verse 8, notice this. There, there's several key verses that I'm draw, trying to draw our attention to. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This is such a marvelous. God remembered Noah. He also found favor in the eyes of the Lord. This favor that, that Noah experienced was, was ultimately God's grace. It was that unearned favor, that unearned merit that God gives us. The favor of the Lord, it's, it's really the first time that this, this word occurs in the scriptures. And because Genesis is, is a book of beginnings, it's a book of first, it's, you're constantly going to be encountering this, this idea of, of first and and here we find a first reference to the, the favor of God. No, he found favor in the eyes of the Lord. The grace of God is what put Noah in right standing with God as someone who was forgiven. He was a man who, who God chose to forgive. It wasn't that Noah was perfect. It wasn't that he was sinless. That was not the case. And you read a little bit further in the story and realize as soon as they get off the ark, it, it doesn't go well. Okay, it doesn't go well. But you explain that to your children, okay? And when you get one of those children's Bibles out, trust me, they'll skip over a few of the passages. Just for, let's get the children's version out there. Hopefully you're reading with your children. If you don't teach your children these stories, trust me, they'll grow up to be like me. They won't know those stories. You have to read them as an adult, right? Like so many of us had to read them as an adult. I don't know. Are you kidding me? Is that really in the Bible? Yeah. Instead of growing up and saying, yeah, it's, I've known it since, you know, it's always, yeah, it's always been in the Bible. Instead of like some of us as adults, wow, I can't believe that. I mean, this is, you're not going to get bored reading the Bible, for sure. 
And so we have this, this man, Noah, who found, who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He was a, a forgiven man. He was, according to verse 9, these, these are the generations of, of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, three characteristics. He was righteous, he was blameless in his generation, and he walked with God. Three characteristics of Noah's life. He was in right standing with God. He received the grace of God. That's how you ultimately are brought into right standing. We have standing before God because of his grace. God opens the door. He gives us an opportunity. By his grace, he extends to us something that we do not deserve. It wasn't as though Noah deserved it, but Noah received it. Having received the grace of God, he walked in the grace of God. He walked righteously. He walked righteously. He walked blamelessly. In moral uprightness, that's what he's talking about. The context demands that because of the horrific sexual sins that were being committed in that day and time. The violence that they were committing against one another, uh, according to, really to verse 11, the earth was corrupt in God's sight. It was, it was corrupt. There, there was such acts of violence that were being committed, to one, uh, committed against one another. The things that they were doing, humanity upon humanity, was, was unbelievable. Noah refrained from those things, is, is the idea. He walked, he walked blame, blamelessly. He maintained an active and ongoing relationship with the Lord. And, and so as a result of this, God blessed them. And, and the way that we see God blessing them in many ways, but one of the ways is that he, they, they were able to give birth to three sons, Shem, Ham, and, and Japheth. These were a part of God's blessing, have, the having of children, procreation, the, the human flourishing, the humanity would continue to expand and fulfill God's command to them to go and to multiply and be fruitful, and as you see it in the next few chapters as well. And so this wonderful thing is occurring, this relationship. He's walking with the Lord. He's, he's faithful. He's, he's fruitful. He's, he's, he's walking in grace. He's walking righteously and blamelessly, and he's experiencing God's blessing in his life. And God's not through with him. God's grace. But we see not only God's grace, his, his approval and affirmation of Noah's life, but we see God's his guidance. We see his guidance. In, in verse 11, the earth was corrupt, there's violence. God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all the flesh was corrupted, corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. This vi- what, what it continues to be so. This violence, it's repeated. Disregard for the image of the other image bearer next to you. When you take the life of another person, when you, when you traffic the other person, when you use the other person, when you degrade them, you reduce them, all of these things, acts of violence can be both physical as well as psychological, that these acts of violence were, were such a, a, a magnitude that, that God brought this judgment. But he wasn't through with them. And he gives them this guidance. And so what follows is the guidance of the building of the ark. And you can take time and you can read the whole construction. It's marvelous. It's worth considering. It's worth, it's worth looking at. But what's important is that we see that this work that Noah is about is a foreshadowing. He's building an ark. He's building something that ultimately, ultimately will provide his safety, his security, in his salvation. Do you know anybody who provided that for us? It's a foreshadowing. In some ways, it's a type of Christ. It's an Old Testament preview of who Christ is going to be. We, we see in the very ark itself is, this, is this, this foreshadowing of what Christ is going to mean to us. You see, just like the ark, Christ provides the only way. John 14, 6 says this, I am the way, the truth, the life. If Jesus would have said, I am a way, I am a truth, and I am a life, something you could experience along the many other pursuits of life, and you would experience the same kind of satisfaction in it, he, if, if that's what he really wanted for us, he would have said it. That's not what he said. He used a definite article. Just, just like Noah, just like God's instruction, no, you build an ark. It will be the only way. 
This is it. There will be no other way, no exceptions for any one of you, none. If you're not on the ark, you're going to miss it. If you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss it. You see, Jesus provides the only way for us. He's the only, way who, he's the only one who can prevent the judgment of God. When Noah stepped onto the ark, when the rain began to fall, and they were shut in, the Bible says, when they were on, it, it prevented the judgment of God. On every other place, the judgment of God fell except for in the ark. The ark. It publicized God's plan. 120 years. That's why I think the New Testament says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Anybody walking by, anybody seeing what was going on, they must have ignored him. Can you imagine if you're Noah, you're building this thing week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, you get the feeling? And it's like, uh, not too many people believe this. Not too many people are really paying any attention to what we're doing over here. And yet it's, it's a proclamation. It's, it's proclaiming this is the way of salvation. Th- this, is the pl- this is the plan. And so it, it, provided the, the ark pro- it provided the only way for safety. It prevented the judgment of God. It was the only place for security. It, it publicized God's plan. It was God's plan for salvation. That's what the ark did. The ark, the teba as the Hebrew language describes it, the teba. It's an interesting word. It's basically the same word that is used in Exodus. If you want to write this down, Exodus 2, verses 3 through 5. In Exodus 2, verses 3 through 5, let me, let me just read this very quickly. Um, now, man, from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket. There's the word teba. It could be translated ark. And made of bulrushes and dabbed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river. While her young women walked beside her, she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman, and she took it. It's a story of how God saved Moses, right? In a little ark. That's what it was. In a little teba. And, and it's an interesting word because it's, it's, it's related to an Egyptian term meaning box or chest. It could... In, in some contexts, it could be translated coffin. He said, what, a coffin? But when you really just sort of think on it and chew on it, it's like, out of a place of death comes forth life. Death all around. That ark, that teba, that, that basket... That vessel, 150 days floating. How could it possibly make it? But it was in the midst of death, the only place for life. That's all that it was. And that's what God did. He, he faithfully delivered, he faithfully delivered him, delivered Noah and his family. And so Noah did exactly several things very quickly, and then I will end this. First of all, Noah did exactly as he was instructed. He did not suggest to God, listen, I think I can build this a little differently, more economically, more efficiently. He didn't come up with his own humanly engineered plan. That would be me. Okay? I just know that. And, you know, you're lying if if you would admit it about your own self. We got these little plans, don't we? We want to come up with our own plan. He did exactly as he was instructed. God's answer to Man's wickedness was a plan, and Noah believed it, and he was saved. God's answer to our own sinfulness is a plan. He sent forth his son. He died on the cross. On him 
fell the weight of our sin. The judgment of God the Father for our sin fell upon the Son. That's the only way for us to experience salvation if we will believe it. But you have to believe it. If you think by any stretch of the imagination that you can step outside that plan and bear on your own shoulders the weight of your own sin, you are fraught with arrogance and pride and religion and a poison of sorts that humanity seems to be infected by throughout the generations. The reality is is that that this, this belief in God's plan is the only thing that saves us. It's faith in what God has done. Noah enters a covenant, and he does so by faith. God says he's going to make a covenant with them. This is the nature of these chapters as well. God says, I'm going to make this covenant with you. These are the things you're going to do. You're going to abide in this covenant. I'm going to fulfill. This is the nature of the covenant. The Noahic covenant is that God says, these are the things I'm going to do. You have to believe. That's your part. You believe and act in obedience in light of what you believe, but these are the things I'm going to do in order to save you. These are the things I'm going to do. And so the ark saved Noah. And if you read the details of it, while they were floating around in that vessel, there was enough food for Noah and his family and all the animals. He sustained them. And throughout all of that, when they departed, when they, when they stepped outside of that, they stepped off that ark, God did everything he said he was going to do. That's what he did. So when you look at this, okay, very quickly, let's land this. So Noah found favor in verse, in verse 8. He found favor in the eyes of the Lord. He did exactly as God wanted him to do. As a result of that, God made this covenant with him. Very simply, this is the story. God made a covenant, and then he fulfilled, he walked in that covenant. He finished the ark according to God's plan. This is in, in the verses that follow. And so in, a, in an interesting passage of Scripture in, verse, in chapter 7, in verse 16, I love this. I love it, and just use your little highlighter here, okay? It's highlighted in my Bible if you want to see right there. He shut him in. So not only did he build the ark, they entered the ark, but then God shuts him in. The idea is that he seals him in the ark. Once he's in the ark, he cannot lose his place or position. He cannot lose his protection he cannot lose his salvation are you following me are you know where i'm going with this once you're in you're in and we christians particularly we who are baptists believe this and i'm unapologetic about this i don't talk a lot about about being baptist necessarily not that i'm ashamed of it but we who are baptists believe in what's called the security of the believer he shut them in We are secure. We persevere. God has done all that he needs to do for us. And once he saves us, we are kept forever and ever and ever. We are his. This is is God's story. This is what he wants for us. And so then in verse 8, chapter 8, verse 1, God remembered Noah. And you, you read this story. And you look at what God's doing with his people and you see that then Noah goes out and, he, and he's fruitful and he multiplies and he experiences what God ultimately designed for him. So what do, we, what do we learn from these stories? We are in the creation era of the 12 eras that we're looking at. And this creation era is reminding us that a world that God created so marvelously is broken very quickly, but God doesn't give up. He deals with us in grace. He deals with us in mercy. Praise be to God that he does that. So you may feel the weight and the heaviness of a sense of what you've done. You should, we should feel this heaviness to what we have done. That whatever wickedness or violence or whatever we've committed that is an offense to Almighty God, that even in that, God is merciful if we will turn and we will believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. This story is a story that will repeat itself throughout. It's the story of redemption. It's the story, the greatest story, the epic story that we find in Noah's Ark for sure. Let's pray. Lord, as we learn and we grow and we experience these these verses so much, so much that we don't have time to discuss this morning, but so much that remind us of your goodness in our life toward us. 
We thank you that it's your goodness that leads us to repentance. It's your goodness that captivates our hearts. It's your love for us that's compelling. And I pray, Lord, as we, we sit before you this morning and we contemplate our own lives and we, we just think about what you're doing, that you do speak to us and we hear it through your word. We read it, we hear it, we speak it. But Lord, most importantly, we, we respond to what you're saying. That when you reveal yourself, when you make yourself known to us, that you call us to hear and to respond. And your grace is necessary for this. Or we just wouldn't do it. So I pray for an outpouring of your grace in this service, Lord. Just be gracious, deep and wide in each of our lives. For those that need to confess you as their Savior, may they do that. For those, Lord, who have been, they've been your child, they know that, and yet they've gotten a little off track or something, they know they're not exactly where they need to be. I pray that they realize that, that they're your child and nothing has changed. You still, you still, you still call them a part of the family. And while they may not be living according to your name right now, God, I pray that they would turn and they would repent and they would renew their fellowship with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.